thank you all for um, for having me again today to talk a little bit about the uh, the IES grant that we recently received and uh, also to get a chance to talk a little bit about the data and the processes um, so the first thing I'd like to do is to remind you of the uh, successes that were achieved through um, uh, through the turning around the lowest achieving schools and you'll see here quite remarkably uh, the proficiency rates uh, in math and science went up in these schools uh, when they were served by um, uh, by uh, the the TALIS program the turning around lowest achieving schools at the same time the teacher value added went up uh, and we also have lots of positives uh, around uh, things like graduation rates and I'll just remind you that this uh, chart that you've seen before the red schools are the turnaround schools the uh, blue bars each represent one of the nearest neighbors the most similar other schools in the state and you see that the graduation rates shot up most consistently in the schools that were participating in the in the turnaround uh, and we see that a lot of the schools that weren't participating uh, didn't make the the kinds of gains uh, so 75 percent of the TALIS schools uh, exceeded the average state growth rate during that time so uh, as uh, Dr. Barber said we wanted to take the best aspects of the TALIS program and then use the data that we had from the schools to help move into the next stage um, and this rather complex um, uh, um, document represents uh, as you see in the middle the the key ingredients uh, in these schools are what we now call tailored supports uh, we provide the Nancy's team provides direct supports to the district level because in our first study of the turnaround between 2006 and 10 we found that districts could inhibit performance uh, uh, as well as contribute to it and sometimes a district coach could help a lot of times districts don't like to treat each school as a separate entity but these schools have very specific challenges that make them unlike a lot of the other schools and they have to be treated as an individual school and sometimes facilitating that at a district level was very important um, uh, in those districts um, at the second level we uh, we provide um, uh, school specific supports and particularly uh, supports to the principal one of the things we found in our first study is that these principals start out with great objectives but the day-to-day -day processes within those schools often distract them to things that aren't directly related to improving student performance and when that happens I see I've got some uh, agreement over here uh, uh, when that happens the principal gets off the major mission of of improving student performance deals with discipline deals with buses I, I was in six of the lowest performing schools uh, in the state of Tennessee last week uh, first school I got to had uh, an ambulance in front of it, a medical emergency and almost everything that that principal and the APs had set out to do for that day uh, observe teachers we we're going to watch them observe teachers that was put on hold until the medical emergency was done now the key is do you get back on track that's going to happen how quickly do you get back on track and it's that coaching that's really fundamental to those kinds of operations and then also providing coaching at the instructional level so when we went out to these schools in the past uh, one of the things our study showed were th was that the teachers had changed the nature of their com uh, conversations because of the value added they were really more focused in the professional learning community meetings on student achievement but they didn't get much feedback and so there is where the idea of <coughs> student surveys came into this process that we saw that they were valid predictors and I'll show you that in just a moment of student achievement gains and therefore the feedback from those 
uh, directly to teachers and uh, hopefully supported by their principal uh, m could be an extension and provide direct data. We know from our uh, previous work that the, uh, the evaluation ratings received by teachers uh, from their principals are global assessments. Generally, teachers are, are very good or uh, pretty good. Uh, so they're at the top end of the scale, but they don't really say the, the rating that a teacher gets for, um, let's say, uh, leadership is not different than the one for facilitating student learning. That's not different from does the teacher know the content. The teacher's rated holistically, and these, the student surveys get a chance to, uh, to uh, 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 basically help to separate different aspects of teachers' instruction. And we chose four based on the literature, and they're in the, uh, the, the column that's next to the right-hand side, pedagogical effectiveness in the classroom, rigorous expectations, student engagement, and classroom climate. Those turned out to be the best predictors of whether that teacher would get better the next year. Their student test scores would increase given how effective the teacher was last year. So these indicators help teachers improve if they get the data. So that was one of the reasonings. You'll see student formative assessments being uh, used as an intermediate outcome. So as, as Dr. Barber said, we can give immediate feedback on whether teachers are improving in that. And that can be placed right back in to the teacher level coaching so the teacher can receive the coaching on the specific issues that they have in a way that we have not been able to tailor those supports based on that kind of data. If you th think for a minute in our administrative data set, all we know is the status of a kid and their prior test scores. This tells us something about how they're receiving their experiences within the classroom, and it's critically important, we believe. Um, so uh, a little more about the grant. Uh, that explains a little bit about some of the changes and why they were put together. Uh, this is a partnership grant between the state board and Martez Hill is, uh, is the lead uh, uh, for the state board on the grant, and Nancy Barber, the lead for this uh, Department of Public Instruction. Um, this particular uh, grant application required that we have a state education agency and a, a, a research institution. Uh, Vanderbilt uh, serves as the uh, primary uh, institution in that regard. However, we're working very closely with uh, Julie Marks and her colleagues, many of whom are here today, uh, as an institution within North Carolina helping to support, and, and we work this back through with Julie uh, and her folks at every turn. We also relied on the expertise of the RAND Corporation. Many of you know RAND uh, was, was begun to give the uh, Department of Defense and the military branches uh, objective information about how they could improve, uh, and they're uh, an outstanding partner for us. The IES required that we focus on one of three areas. Turnaround, and even though we call it transformation here, uh, the feds still call it turnaround. So uh, I'll use that language more uh, because we're conforming to their uh, terminology. Uh, it had to be turnaround, teacher evaluation, or standards and assessment. Uh, we met with folks, uh, 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 Martez, uh, Audrey Martin McCoy, many folks in the department, Nancy and others, uh, to discuss what the focus should be. Uh, and uh, turnaround or transformation was the focus. Only three evaluations were funded in 2015. So North Carolina's uh, uh, credentials and proposals uh, was one of the best three in the country. I'm not sure how many were submitted, but I think on the order of, of about 30 were submitted. So um, uh, we, we uh, plan in this grant to examine 75 schools that are undergoing uh, transformation through NCT and we're going to compare those with 86 other schools in North Carolina who are similarly low performing but not as low performing as the uh, NCT schools. 
Here you can see the map with the NCT schools uh, location. So this is what we refer to as a thermometer grant. The, the reds uh, indicate uh, more schools in those districts than the, uh, than the colder colors in the blue and, uh, and, uh, and light blue you see there. And then the comparison schools, those 86 schools, are located, as you can see, very proximal to the schools that are actually receiving services. Um, and as you may know, the, the 10 largest districts uh, were not included in this. Uh, uh, it's mainly uh, it, because one of the things we found in a prior study, the smaller districts simply don't have the capacity in many cases to have this uh, turnaround go on. So the services are, are uh, uh, more targeted toward those, um, those districts. Uh, but the chronically low performing schools there. So uh, here are the research questions. Uh, our first uh, and, and most important uh, question uh, in the eyes of IES uh, at the federal level is uh, how effective is this? Does it affect teachers um, and student outcomes? Because we know that, that retention, teacher retention in these schools is about 10 percentage points or more lower the turnaround is simply very high in these schools, and so we've got to focus on teacher as well as student outcomes. Um, but the question came up in our initial studies, uh, what are the outcomes for the lowest achieving students? And we saw in the past that some students were able to move from level one or level two to proficiency, but not all students in these schools. So we don't have much data on those students and how they're receiving, how we might uh, intervene uh, to help those particular students. So a, per, a third research question for this study is to focus on what mediates and those variables, pedagogical effectiveness, classroom climate, are they suppressing positive effects that are going on in the rest of the, uh, of the school that could lead to better levels of student success? So we're really focused on student success in all of those questions. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Barber said earlier, we're also trying to get information on the um, uh, quality of the services. So uh, we will be immediately feeding back based on our site visits and data collection uh, with Nancy and her folks and having uh, a large summer meeting where we bring all those data together in time that any tweaks to this process could be made before the next year's uh, coaching and transformation begin. Um, uh, also just want to point out we're using two kinds of designs. These are uh, based on the USDOE hierarchy and uh, they do not fund uh, grants unless they use one of these two types of designs and, uh, or, or, or randomized experiments as a third. And so we, we had to use those to meet the uh, standards. We also used them in the TALIS study and the same design was used in the study of the original turnaround from 2006 to 2010. So one of the things that came up a lot in our conversations about what we're going to do and uh, is that we have no uh, information that connects back to the students and their experiences in these schools. We don't know very much about why some students are more successful than others in the turnaround schools and we don't know how they experience the turnaround process. That's never been a part of what we've done. So we uh, included in our proposal the idea that we needed systematic data uh, uh, more than just whether uh, a student was economically disadvantaged or an English language learner, we need to know about what they're experiencing day to day. And uh, I, I want to tell you, when Ron Ferguson first started talking about his surveys, the, the biggest uh, uh, I don't think that's going to work was right here. Uh, I did not think that the student surveys would be reliable enough to produce information that allowed us to predict how, how much better teachers became. But I looked at the data. Uh, I not only looked at it, we went back and took some of the data that, that Tom um, uh, was talking about earlier, and we turned it upside down. 
looking at these and I have gone from a from a skeptic to a convert I believe these provide incredibly important information and they're much more reliable than what I ever would imagine so the student surveys are we believe are a key for starting to move forward to isolate specific strengths and weaknesses of teachers and have them acted upon in a way that helps students learn. So our guiding principle in this study is in everything we've done is use uh, administrative data for everything we can use. The only thing that we found we did not have administrative data that was sufficient was really understanding how students experience their classroom every day. And those, um, uh, as uh, Ms. Triplett referred to earlier, uh, one of the best predictors of whether a student's going to do well and graduate is whether they have at least one warm, caring adult in their school. But we have no data to suggest whether that exists in these turnaround schools where literally the whole teaching workforce turns around every three years. And that, that's not what we see in these other schools. There's a chance for those teachers and those students to have a relationship that there may simply not be a teacher there who has that continuity in many of these schools. And so if we, if we want to really understand and be able to improve the schooling for these students who are our most at risk, we really need more data to help us focus in on how to do that. And I would say uh, uh, the, the student surveys, um, uh, we tested the validity of these rigorously. So what we did was take uh, those surveys from 2011, I, th I believe I got the right year, and we looked at one scale here that I wanted to show you uh, today. It's the rigorous expectation scales. Uh, it's called challenge on the, uh, on the tripod survey. It's very similar to the rigorous expectations, correlates very highly. So here's, here's the takeaway. If half the teachers, students in a classroom move from somewhat true to mostly true on that scale if half the teachers move so that the teachers own average score moved a half a point 74 percent of those teachers who do not meet expectations would move to meet 80 percent of those teachers who met would then exceed that's the predictive power of this survey so and those expectations are based on the student test score gains above what would be expected from the students prior test scores so these have uh, incredible <coughs> validity here in North Carolina um, the survey that we're going to use uh, it, the survey that's out there and available to use that uh, uh, has been planned to be used uh, was found reliable and valid in other settings uh, we uh, plan to test the reliability and validity of every item on that survey for North Carolina. Any items or scales that are not valid will simply be removed. As Tom said, this is open source, so we and you can tailor this for use in North Carolina. The survey responses can be used for formative feedback there can be professional development provided for this. Um, EVOS is a, an important tool, but it's only available for about 35% of the teachers, and <coughs> it provides no information on how to improve. It tells you what you need to do. It doesn't tell you how to do it. And the uh, survey responses uh, for, mo we can get them for most regular classroom teachers through a survey and they are highly predictive. The, one of the problems comes in here is that uh, the schools and the teachers that need this most are the least likely to volunteer to get this done. So the, the novice teacher starting out in a turnaround school who probably is not aware of the survey, and if she has to go back and make this up herself, 
the, the, it, it's simply unlikely to get done. And then, even if she does, she doesn't know how she compares to the other teachers in the school, or more importantly, in schools that are high performing. And that's, the, that's a huge added benefit of having a student survey and having the teacher receive this feedback. As, as uh, Dr. Tomberlin said, the, uh, the, the, if you try it in North Carolina, it's been shown you like it and you want to go further. It's getting people to try it and administer it that is, uh, that is a, a significant issue that, that um, we think needs to be um, uh, con uh, Dr. Henry, directed. Dr. Yeah. Henry, uh, do you have a question? Sure. It's pertinent to what you're saying now. I guess I'm trying to get my head around surveys and what's going on. It would appear that you're saying that these surveys are going to be mandatory in the schools that, no, uh, no, that you no, have the that, grants? No, not at all. All I'm saying is that uh, this uh, uh, has been developed. The idea of using this survey has been developed because the empirical data shows it has a strong relation. The, the decision is completely the board's. You're, you're our wait, partner. These, this is your decision. We wait didn't a minute, wait mandate. A minute. I'm, I'm trying to understand. I understand your, your premise. You said that before when you hear about the reliability of the surveys. I get that. What I'm getting at is whether or not we have signed into this grant and as a result of the grant these schools that are going to be participating in the grants we're going to have mandatory surveys i'm not saying i'm against it or for it i'm just saying that the process of getting to mandating schools to do surveys needs to be thought out for all the reasons we've just had discussion about last time so that's my question if this grant goes forward the way you're asking will those 75 schools uh be mandated to do surveys and if so what is the process for us getting there well um i, I the, the the direct answer is no the superintendent's been clear this is a voluntary uh process at this point so there is no mandate uh that was in the grant proposal or anywhere else that these would be required we hope that uh, it would be my strong desire and, and belief that if we had a mandate, we would be much better off uh, in terms of this information being provided. But that's the board's decision uh, to move forward. I, I believe the data and the evidence support that this could help, be a tremendous help for these chronically low performing schools, but that's your, so your we, choice. So will you be asking the board to make <laughs> that decision no, 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 or not? Mr. Hill, uh, Mr. Hill so, Mr. Collins, I, I uh, sent the board members a copy of a letter from Dr. Atkinson and, and Mr. Kobe basically informing the board um, of a communication that we've sent out to the superintendents where the 75 and 85 schools reside. And the plan is to ask the, those superintendents to participate in this evaluation and inform them of the components of the evaluation and explain to them why these various components are really, really helpful. One reason I wanted Nancy to present to the board is to show you and the, um, the superintendents that this evaluation is really just a continuation of the services that uh, Nancy and her folks are providing. Nancy. Uh, and her team uh, called all superintendents and asked those superintendents if they would be interested in, in continuing to receive services from DST. And so my subsequent phone call will be to ask those same superintendents to participate in this evaluation because we need to collect <coughs> data to prove to the state board and to our legislators that this involvement and, and, and these services are worthy of continuing investment and, and that the policy is accurate and on point. So when Dr. Atkinson is telling the superintendents this whole survey idea came from the state board, it's really coming from this grant. Is that what you're saying? No. Um, I, I think what Dr. Atkinson uh, displayed earlier is that going back to 2008, 2009, we've had an ongoing conversation about how student surveys could actually be part of our continuous improvement. Uh, sitting at this table uh, going back to 2010, um, I, I've heard those presentations and uh, even after I think 2012, the department talked continuously about uh, how we can improve our teacher effectiveness system, 
present that information to the board. And candidly, I perceived that the board was interested in us moving forward uh, on, on student surveys. And when Gary Henry and I talked about this opportunity to participate in a grant, I, I heard the but, research and but said, I, What wow, I'm hearing him say is that we're going to get to make a decision about whether we're going to mandate surveys or let surveys go forward. I hear, I hear from June that, oh, it's, it's just uh, voluntary and everybody gets to know what they're doing. And all I'm asking for is a process. I'm not saying I'm against them or before them, but if we're going to have to make a decision with respect to surveys, we, we all have been inundated by superintendents around this state because of the miscommunication on this issue. And I don't want to have another month of this because I, I, I am still confused as to where we are with the surveys but it's exactly what I thought. It has something to do with the grant and it has something to do with data collection. So uh, if it's only gonna be with these 75 schools, we need to know about it. We need to know what the process is. And that's, that's all I'm asking for. Uh, because the, the impression in this state is that this board is going forth with a survey mandate across the state by one way or the other. And I and I think other people are, are, be, are just now understanding what's going on. And I'm, I'm just concerned that we make it very clear exactly what's going on because if we don't know, I can tell you the superintendent's not gonna know at all. And, um, and as I indicated last month, there was a, there were superintendents that told me that they had a representative of DPI telling me it was gonna be mandated. And that's the word that got around. And, um, and I think it's very clear if it's about, it's about this grant, we need to make sure it's that way. Dr. Atkins. Um, in reading the con excuse me, in reading the contents of the letter that Mr. Hill has shared with everyone, the letter talks about we ask you to participate, we encourage you to, to participate. The letter does not say you have to participate. So I think that's a very important point that we want we want the schools to participate, but ultimately if a superintendent decides no, I don't want to be a part of doing student surveys, then so be it. And that's why we keep saying that it is voluntary. It's, there's nothing in the grant proposal that requires, uh, it, it was in the grant proposal that uh, the student survey would be available. Uh, and so that, uh, but the word that went out on encouraging is exactly what um, we would hope would be done with these schools. We believe it's a, a very big um, uh, uh, support and provides direct evidence about teachers to move forward, uh, but there's not a requirement of this grant that this be done. It is a, um, we have said that that would be available. Okay, Mr. Henry, please uh, continue. So um, a few of the other uh, important uh, features of the, of the grant, we're uh, assembling an expert teacher and principal advisory committee. I understand we've, uh, we've gotten some expert advice already today about our uh, 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 principal and teacher <coughs> surveys that are gonna be administered and that um, we're anxious to take advantage of that advice. We're gonna convene that group at least twice a year and so what we'll do there is to advise um, uh, the, um, the, the expert panel on the findings that we have, ask them to help us interpret, and then think through recommendations for how the services might be tweaked, and then bring that back on, on that basis. And um, uh, I believe three of the board members have agreed to serve on that, um, who have expertise in that area, and we, um, we look forward to, uh, to continuing to engage uh, with them uh, as we have begun already. Um, we will provide detailed information on implementation <coughs> in time for DPI to adjust if needed. So we have a, a pre-look at the data with uh, the NCT team in February every year based on the site visits we're, uh, we're involved with that will come uh, concurrently with the meeting of the expert teacher and principal advisory committee and then we have a full-blown meeting after all the data are collected in June in order to set directions and practice for the next year we believe that will be just in time information for tweaking any processes that need to be tweak, tweaked as, as a part of this um, we'll be uh, comparing the performance on 
as many variables as possible in each of these schools in turning, including teacher turnaround. One of the things we've just become aware of that principals have talked about but we haven't measured correctly in the past is how much turnover occurs during the school year. We're finding it's about 50% higher. It's going to take those figures 50% higher and it's much larger in these schools than in other schools. But it's never been looked at before and we're um, uh, I think that kind of information lets us know the challenge that these uh, principals are, are facing and bringing that back means we probably have to have a true teacher recruitment and retention strategy along with some of the other things that we're doing in these schools. Um, we're going to be able to provide evidence about why some students succeed and others do not. Uh, hopefully that information will be more specific uh, about the students and about things that are suppressing the positive effects that other students are getting and um, we'll uh, hopefully we'll have the data that allow us uh, to do that and be evidence-based as we move forward over the next um, uh, five years together in this partnership so I appreciate uh, the time today and um, I uh, hope that we have uh, many uh, uh, additional conversations in the future about about what the partnership is and I'd be happy to answer any questions Mr. Dr. Oxen. Thank you so much. Um, a point that I want to go back to for just a minute, um, and it ties into Mr. Collins' question, the letter that has been sent to the, the school systems, the 75 school districts, schools or? There's 75 schools. Okay, 75 and schools, that this is voluntary, it isn't mandatory. But how dependent on the, um, uh, is the grant heavily dependent on student surveys and the participation of those schools in the survey um, piece that well, we were talking I, about? I, I want to separate dependent in two senses. Um, the grant can go on, the partnership can go on whether or not the student surveys are done. So uh, they're offered. Uh, we feel, uh, based on the evidence that we have, that these surveys are key tools to put in the hands of teachers and principals in these schools and the coaches. So I believe to achieve the maximum effects for these students over time that the student surveys are incredibly important and we hope to be able to persuade most of the principals to be able to, to uh, uh, that they would want to use this and the superintendents. It is going to be incredibly more powerful if we're norming this on our lowest performing schools. Those norms are not going to be adequate to get these students where they need to go. So from a standpoint of the evidence we can provide and the support can be provided for teachers and principals, uh, I, I think we, we uh, at least I, let me speak for myself, I believe the student surveys are a key component of that and we don't have any substitute for those data. Teacher working conditions, we've tested. We've tested other surveys. They don't predict how well students do and how well teachers do as well as the student surveys. If there was another alternative that was easier, uh, we would use it. What other type of data would you collect? Let's assume that a high percentage of this, the schools say no to the surveys. What other data would would be worthy of collecting or must you collect because of uh, the obligations to the funder? So we um, are obligated to do principal and teacher surveys and those would be done in all of the NCT schools as well as the comparison schools and that those data really focus on the implementation fidelity and quality so did they get the services that they were supposed to have gotten uh, what's the duration of the coaching is it one day per semester or is it a day per week is the coaching going to the teachers whose uh, uh, value added and other indicators would suggest need them most or is it going to teachers who who enjoy uh, that 
that uh, sort of feedback. So we'll collect data on surveys. We're going in site visits to every one of the schools next year, and we're asking principals and teachers specifically about the quality and level of services that they're receiving from NCT. So we do have um, a lot of additional data to add to the administrative data that we'll get directly from principals and teachers, and we'll get it from the, the schools in NCT and the comparison schools. Thank you. Um, Ms. Taylor. Um, and you may have said this if I blanked out while you're saying I apologize. Um, yeah, so these surveys are specifically for this targeted population that you're trying to research, get the data so you can analyze how to move forward with these schools. Um, I'm not opposed to the survey as much as I probably am the implementation. I mean, is, is this a pretty simple survey or, or you know, or is it going to be a, a 60 question one? Is it going to be very, okay, so it's going to be brief. It does not take a lot of time from the folks that are taking it. That's right. And um, as far as administering it, because I'm, you know, like Dr. Oxendine said, if a student has difficulty reading, or will it be delivered in a way so that it can be read to students who cannot read? No, that's not a, a piece of it in, in particular because we, we worry about uh, the teacher reading <laughs> and not yeah, influencing the responses. So mm -hmm. we wouldn't uh, do it that way. Uh, all I can say is we've, we're, we're only planning down to grade three. Mm -hmm. We've done this to kindergarten and the data are still reliable. Mm -hmm. So anything, any question they have trouble answering, that's a difficulty. Uh, it would certainly show up and I, we do an item by item analysis and it would um, it would show up okay well y'all are researchers so I trust that you know how to design questions I'm not gonna go there um, well at least like a, a teacher a principal someone out in the field look at it and say oh gosh this is way too wordy or these words are too big for these kids I mean are, are y'all seeking that input at least um, we certainly could talk about that. I, I would say that uh, what we have done is test different ways of asking the same, same question. questions. Right. And we find some are reliable and some are not. So we're using social science right. to determine this rather than people's feelings about questions. Because I, I for one, um, I haven't had a third grader in my house for a long time, so I wouldn't know how to design that question, but I'd certainly have an opinion about it. Right. So, um, uh, so we've gone out and asked third graders. I trust your research skills. So, I mean, I just, that's my concern, and I know some teachers will probably question that as well. But, yeah, you know how to analyze it, so. And, and they'll have the responses back. They get the feedback. So if they discount this question but think these others are great, then, then, you know, that we just need to get this evidence and we need to get in the hands of principals and teachers if we're really going to move all these kids forward. Well, thank you, Dr. Henry. We appreciate the presentation and appreciate the discussion that, that took place.